Welcome back. Today I'm continuing the process to convert my 1981 DeLorean into an electric vehicle. On today's episode, I'm going to show you the design and fabrication of these two battery boxes. To catch you up quickly, I'm taking the entire drivetrain out of a Chevy Bolt, the electric motor, the inverter, the batteries, the electronics, everything, and moving them into the DeLorean. This is Project Lightning. Back in episode six, I showed off a preliminary design for where the battery modules would be located in the DeLorean. Due to weight and space constraints, I need to get half of the pack up front in the trunk and half of the pack in the rear. Now that the DeLorean is stripped down, it's time to validate that design and see if it works. I started off by taking a bunch of reference photos and measuring the amount of space available in the rear. The DeLorean has a lot of space here, since this is where the V6 engine used to be located. I then did the same up front. Here it's a bit more tricky though, because the plastic tub is going to be removed and I need to account for the brake booster and steering linkage. I'll remove the tub in a future episode, but here's a sneak peek with some dimensions. Then I jumped into SketchUp and created 3D models of the battery modules. Then I put them in various orientations to see what would fit and what wouldn't. Also, notice here that there are two modules that are slightly shorter than the other eight. I had originally settled on a design for the rear battery pack that had all five modules standing up and packaged with a cover on each end. However, once I mounted the electric motor in the car, I realized that I no longer had enough room for this configuration. After iterating on the design, I finally decided to put the small battery module under the pack, which allows it to fit behind the rear cross member without raising the pack. Let me walk you through the features of the design. Starting with a single module, you can see the BMS connectors on the front side. The main positive and negative battery connections at the top are in red and green, and the white cylinders represent the threaded rod that goes through the pack and holds the cells together. I'll toss in a mock-up of the cooling plate, the design of which I will cover in another episode, but each battery module will be heated and cooled as needed. The main pack will have four of these stacked next to each other. The cooling plates will have a thin insulator, so modules in the center are not cooled faster than the ones on the outside. The long edges of each module have an area that the stock bolt battery pack uses to hold the battery, so I'm going to use those. Each module's edge will sit on a support plate that holds most of the weight of the pack. These plates are 1 8 inch mild steel, but the rest of the pack uses 3 16 inch steel. Most of the construction is using 2 inch by 2 inch angle and 2 inch flat bar. Then on the front and back side of the pack, I will have mounting plates with 6 millimeter holes that line up with the 6 millimeter threaded rods coming through each module. Each one will be held in place with a nut, which prevents the modules from moving around. Uprights are then added to hold the structure together. Finally, a top is added that clears the cooling plates and creates a space for bus bars, BMS wiring, and coolant distribution. An essential feature is that the front is actually a cover that can be removed. This way, the box can be constructed, filled with modules, and then closed up, as well as allowing for disassembly if needed. Once the main pack is complete, an additional lower section is created for a single small module below using similar construction. The lower module will also have a cover plate for assembly and disassembly. A mirrored version of the pack will also be created for the front of the car. The additional small module won't fit below it, so instead that module will be located in the gas tank area a few inches away. Also, at some point in the future, the pack will have closing plates installed on each side to make them watertight. With the design complete, I was able to create a cut list. I'm using a 14 inch chop saw with an abrasive cutting disc for most of the work. I also use an angle grinder with cutoff discs and a 120 grit flap disc. First up is to cut all of the threaded rod. 
Since there are 10 battery modules and each one has four, there is a lot of repeat cuts. Each cut edge of the threaded rod then has to be quickly cleaned up on the grinder and wire wheel. This is then repeated 80 times. Then, each edge gets a run through using a die set to further clean up the threads, and I test fit each one with a nut. This is again repeated 80 times. Each threaded rod then needs to have a nut permanently attached, and properly spaced to allow it to attach to the pack. The first nut going on will be pressed against the battery module, then it is spaced with a 3 16 inch spacer and another nut. I tried welding it on with very poor results, so here I am using blue Loctite. If you don't use Loctite, then as you tighten the nuts, it will eventually bind up and start tightening from the wrong side, messing up the spacing. After testing with blue Loctite, I found that it was also not strong enough, so I switched over to the red permanent Loctite, which was much better. Luckily, I did this test before putting blue Loctite on all 40 threaded rods. Just kidding, I'm an idiot. I put it on all 40. Then I had to remove Loctite from all 40 threaded rods with a wire wheel and also all 40 nuts by soaking them in acetone. Then repeat the entire process with red Loctite 40 times. With the threaded rods ready to go, each battery module was put together and the nuts tightened down. The battery modules are very flimsy without the threaded rod in place, and it isn't safe to move them around, but once tightened up, the pack is a lot more sturdy. The next step is to head back over to the chop saw and cut all of the materials for the battery boxes. I left the material all a little bit long so I could trim it back as needed. Just like with the threaded rod, each piece then has to be cleaned up. Here I'm using a flap disc, which only takes a few seconds per cut edge. To get the placement of the holes for the threaded rod correct, I modeled the plates in Fusion 360 and then printed out paper templates. Each plate is longer than a standard sheet of paper, so I split it on two pieces and then glued them together, making sure to align the holes that I had overlapped on each page. The template was then cut out and glued to the plates. The center location of each hole was set with a punch. Each hole was then drilled out on a drill press. Some of the corners of the box have to be coped so that the two pieces of angle can come together. So here I am cutting the first one. The first few pieces of metal can then be mocked up and aligned. Then their locations get marked with a scribe. The edge piece of angle has two lengths of flat bar welded to it. These are what the battery module sits on. They are each one half inches wide or 12.7 millimeter. And the battery module support edge is 15.5 millimeter. So placement has to be within three millimeters or one eighth of an inch. Once the first support bar is in place, all of the other bars go into place easily because they align with the holes I drilled in the back mounting plate. The final support bar and side of the battery pack can be aligned once the battery module is in place. I used small 3D printed cubes that are the same size as the cooling plate to act as spacers. The front edge of the BMS connector is then used to mark each side using a square to act as a spacer. This gives me a line to cut the side pieces of angle to, and it's what I use to place the underside crossbar. The crossbar is then welded in place and the bottom frame of the battery pack is trimmed. Here's a look at the completed bottom frame before we continue on. I'm going to put two battery modules back in, bolt them down, and then add the other three braces to the pack and bolt them all down. 
This will ensure that the pack is all square and aligned. A piece of the coolant plate then goes into place. This is a bit of a sneak preview of the cooling system that is to come. This piece is going to tell me exactly how tall the battery pack needs to be and lets me measure the size of the first riser. This riser is then cut from 2 inch flat bar and welded to the lower piece of angle. The process is then repeated for the next riser, and then the remaining joints are tacked. I can also tack on the upper rear plate with the holes in it. This is then repeated on the other side of the pack. Note that I'm using a piece of 1 8 inch flat bar to ensure proper spacing of the risers. The final piece of the pack frame, which is a support bar that goes on the top front, can then be cut and tacked into place. The front cover is then fabricated. Unfortunately, I lost some footage here, but I think you get the idea. There is a piece of angle on each side. It is coped at the bottom to attach to the lower piece of angle with the holes in it, and then it is also notched to fit around the upper plate. The cover is then trimmed to sit flush with the top of the pack. The front cover is held in place with about 15 small button head screws. I mark the location of each, then drill a 5mm hole through the cover and the main frame. Each hole is held together temporarily with a Clico, and I take care to use a shim to ensure that the cover is centered properly. The pack can then be disassembled and all of the joints that were tacked can now be fully welded. Now, the 5mm holes drilled in the cover can be re-drilled to 6mm, and the 5mm holes drilled in the pack frame are tapped to 6mm. This allows me to use a 6mm screw to hold the cover to the rest of the pack.
All of the welds are then smoothed over with a flap disc. The resulting pack looks pretty great, considering this is my biggest fabrication project so far. The pack is then spray painted black to prevent rust. The final step, which I had forgotten earlier, is to drill and tap out four 8mm holes on the top so that I can add lift points to the pack. These will be essential when the pack is filled with battery modules and weighs around 400 pounds. Speaking of weight, the empty frame weighs in at 44.9 pounds. All of this process is then repeated for the second pack, which is built the same, just mirrored. Now that the packs have been built, let me go over some things I've learned or would change. Number one. Angle iron has rounded inside corners. I should have used flat bar for everything and then welded the corners. The cover, in particular, required lots of angle grinding to square up the inside edge so that it would sit flush to the pack. Number two, six millimeter threaded rod in seven millimeter holes was a pain. I kept trying to align it at each step of the way, loosening the bolts, getting them in place, then retightening them, and even made a 3D printed jig to hold the threads to get them centered, but it honestly didn't matter. I should have used 7mm holes from the start, and then I wouldn't have to think about it. Number three, it's very easy to get the angles off a little bit while welding, and I had to go back and redo some. A better welding table would be nice. Number four, 3 16 inch steel was unnecessary. Next time I'll use 1 8 inch for everything. Number five, just laser cut everything. I was really worried about the dimensions being slightly wrong, so building the frame around the modules worked well. But after I was done, I checked my dimensions and they were only off by a couple of millimeters in each direction. Laser cutting would be moderately more expensive, but would have saved me days of work and resulted in a nicer end result. And there you have it. I now have these two battery boxes that are ready to have battery modules installed in them, and then we'll get them in the DeLorean. If this seems like a fun project, you won't want to miss out on these next episodes. So please show me that you're interested and give me your support by subscribing. This is Project Lightning.